Hello and welcome to the latest Insider interview. Our guest today is Sebastian Lyon, manager of the Personal Assets Trust. Sebastian, thank you for coming in. Sam, it's a pleasure. Good to see you. So please tell me a little bit about the trust. It's a wealth preservation trust. Is that accurate? And how do you invest to preserve wealth? It is a wealth preservation trust. I mean, I think that is one of the best, better descriptions. Um, we are trying to generate absolute returns over the long term. But I think importantly for investors who've you know, earned their money and don't want to lose it, we're not speculating. We're not trying to, trying to make money aggressively. We are trying to protect the real value of people's capital and grow it. Um, and the first thing is protect first. Um, if the opportunities are there, to um, make good returns, we will take those opportunities. Uh, if, as at the moment, which I'm sure we'll come on to, it's harder, um, then we'll be more defensive. And um, I, I think we've proven over the long term that uh, we've, we've, we've achieved, that, achieved that aim. And how do you invest then to achieve that aim? Well, uh, es essentially we have a, a very broad canvas uh, to paint on, which is, which is fortunate. Um, so we're not in any way handicapped. We don't have to invest in long terms of index lines. Uh, we don't have to be fully invested in equities. If we don't think equities are the right place to be, we have we've invested in various asset classes over the years, predominantly in equities, and that's where probably between 60 and 70 percent of our returns have come from equities. But we also hold fixed income. We've owned credit. We've owned preference shares. We we own gold, um, gold shares. Um, we ha we we're not shy of holding cash and having liquidity uh, through various uh, through through various amounts. So um, so we can we pr pretty much can go anywhere. Where we tend not to go are those highly speculative areas. We tend not to invest in places like emerging markets. So we want to be in uh, well recognised markets where uh, the the pricing is obvious and and liquidity is is good. Last year was a very tough year for stock markets. How did your portfolio perform and what worked for you? What helped you protect investors? Well, we were down between 3 and 4%, uh, which was satisfactory, I would say. Uh, we don't like losing money. Um, clearly, it was the most difficult year, certainly since 2008. We actually made money in 2008 very modestly. Um, I think it was, in some respects, it was harder than 2008. And the reason for that was in 2008, there were places to hide. You could, you could hold bonds. Um, and, and, and make some money um, and diversify in a way that last year bonds and equities fell. In fact, bonds fell pretty much the same as equities globally. So um, there wasn't that, that barbell relationship with bonds and equities that there has been hitherto. And we, we've been warning investors that that was the case, that when, when the bond markets eventually turn, that it was actually going to be very difficult to protect capital. Um, but we were very defensively positioned going into 2022. We'd reduced our equity exposure a great deal down into the sort of the low 30s, 20s percent, which is the lowest they've been. It's been for a very long time, certainly since around the financial crisis. Um, so we were very defensively positioned, which allowed us to, to effectively protect capital. Um, the other thing is, is that we, uh, we had quite a meaningful exposure to the US dollar, which obviously went up in sterling terms. So that, that, that helped um, gold, which we hold uh, went up again in in not in dollar terms but in sterling terms went up so and we don't hedge our gold so um, there were some pluses um, our stocks did uh, did reasonably well we certainly outperformed uh, the equity benchmarks um, companies like Unilever for example um, actually made a positive return in 2022 so while there were there were some negative returns within the equity part of the portfolio it wasn't all negative by any stretch but it, it was a it was a very difficult year from from the point of view of attempting to do our job which is preserve capital does your defensive approach mean that you sacrifice gains in bull markets and do you even mind that? The downside is more important. Um, you know, this isn't about being greedy. Uh, this is about uh, being relatively conservative and relatively cautious. Um, particularly when we've been in such a long bull market, uh, we inevitably became more cautious and reduced our equity exposure as we went through the bull market over the last decade. So if you look back to 2009, uh, we had 70 plus percent in equities. By before COVID, we had about 40 percent, 30 percent in equities. Uh, and then obviously we had the COVID blowout during 2020 and 2021. And through that, and what we tend to do is, uh, I would I'd express it in terms of either leaning into risk or leaning back from risk. When 
prices fall and we're paid to take risk, we will lean in and take risk. So for example, during COVID, during February and March of 2020, we actually lent in, took a little bit more risk. Um, obviously markets fell very quickly and, and recovered very quickly. Um, but we were recognizing that we were near the end of the cycle anyway. When it came to 2021, when we really did see that, the full um, blowout um, and, and a sort of a similar type of environment to the tech bubble. There, there were differences, but there were, there were definitely similarities in terms of the, in terms of the retail participation, uh, as an example. Uh, then uh, we actually lent back from risk and really took a lot of risk off the table throughout 2021. And yes, that did mean that probably we missed the, those last, um, those last sort of, that last sort of blow off. But, um, um, but the thing is, you, you can never time it. You never know when there, there's, there is no bell uh, telling you when the top is. Uh, it certainly felt very febrile and, and, and very sort of a, a, quite a greedy market back in um, the beginning of 2020, 2021 and through 2021. So um, we were permanently looking at the valuations of the portfolio, looking at the valuations of the overall market and thinking we just want to take less risk. And, uh, and actually, so when we came into 2022, which is really right from the beginning of 2022 onwards, and then obviously we had Ukraine um, uh, in February of, uh, of, of last year, which really you know, tipped the whole bear market um, over or really started the bear market in, in full force, then um, we were already positioned. Um, because if you, were, if, you, if you weren't already positioned, it was, it was really too late. So you have to, you have to be ready for these, these eventualities. You can't expect to be able to pivot a portfolio within a matter of days, you know, notwithstanding the fact that we've got a relatively liquid portfolio. We're now in this environment of higher interest rates, higher inflation. Do you think that's going to persist and how do you invest to make money in this type of environment? Well, I think one of the things that we've been saying to investors is I think it's going to get harder. And I think that people have got to be realistic about their assumptions. You know, we, have, we have some clients, uh, particularly charities, who don't necessarily give us an index um, benchmark, but they will give us a, an RPI plus two or RPI plus three or RPI plus four. Now, clearly last year with RPI at 10, 11, 12, trying to generate RPI plus two or three is just not objective. And I think so I think people have to be uh, have to recognize that um, returns are effectively going to be more modest. Certainly real returns are going to be more modest. Uh, but whereas in the past, the last decade, you know, with inflation being 2% pretty much throughout that period between one and 2%, you know, making real returns was a awful lot easier. So I think the key thing is initially is to have realistic expectations. Um, if, you're, if you're going to expect RPI plus plus an amount, then I think you're going to have to take a lot of risk uh, in order to achieve that. And that will inevitably be in an environment where interest rates are higher, so the cost of capital is higher. So that means, generally speaking, valuations are become lower. Uh, and that's really what we saw in 2022. 2022 wasn't about um, a recession. It wasn't about earnings falling. It was about valuations falling. And that's why it was, it was particularly painful. And I think that we are in an environment where we can expect valuations to continue to fall. We, we were in a period really from 2010 to 2020 of valuations getting higher and higher and higher and effectively people paying more for the same thing people paying a multiple of 15 times earnings, 15 times profits in 2010. By 2020, certainly the end of 2020 and 2021, people were paying 20 times, 25 times, 30 times for essentially exactly the same thing. And what I expect is if, if inflation remains more sticky, which I expect that it will over the next five or 10 years, then interest rates probably need to be higher than sort of we've been used to in the past. Uh, and therefore those valuations are likely to come down. And that's why we're almost as defensively positioned as we are, because I would expect that inflation will remain sticky for, for all sorts of reasons. But I think the main reason is wages. Wages have not been rising for, for a long time. Um, and, and wages are the things that make inflation sticky. You know, in the past, we've seen inflation peak and trough and peak and trough. Um, I can think of an example after the financial crisis when, uh, well, before the financial crisis, when the oil price peaked at what's still an all-time high, I think it's sort of $140. Uh, we saw inflation peak in, in 2008. Inflation came clattering down. And then we saw sterling was very weak. And so we imported a lot of inflation in 2010. And that, again, that dissipated. So there were short cycles of inflation, uh, which were never sustained. Uh, 
Uh, whereas now, I think with, with deglobalization, with a lot of the forces that kept inflation very low, um, now not necessarily in place any longer, uh, and, and geopolitics being far, far more important, I think, for investors, uh, inflation is likely to remain, remain sticky for, for longer. Obviously, there is the base effect, which I think we're seeing at the moment. So we're seeing comparisons with this time last year, um, with, with the oil price having spiked in, in February uh, during the invasion of Ukraine. So there, there is that base effect. So we are seeing, as we saw yesterday, the CPI in the US begin to fall. UK has actually been stickier and, and more stubborn, uh, which is quite characteristic of the UK. Um, but we will see that base effect. But the question is, it's, it's not so much what happens now, because the base effect is obvious as we compare one year against another year. It's actually what happens sort of next year and the year after and how sticky that inflation is. And we'll yet see. But I think the key thing is, as an investor, I think we need to stay open-minded about that future inflation rather than think things are going to come back to exactly where they were prior to COVID. We're going to go back to a world where inflation remains at 2% and stays at 2%. I think central bankers sort of know that, which is why um, we're positioned in the way that we are and, and why um, interest rates are, wh are where they are as well. Now in this environment of high interest rates, which is putting pressure on economies, putting pressures on some parts of the stock market, like the banking sector, so what could be the next part of the market to be under pressure? And how do you invest in this environment? What do you avoid investing in? I think, Sam, it's really interesting what we're seeing at the moment in terms of particularly during the first quarter with um, Silicon Valley Bank and, um, and the, the very, very sudden uh, sort of surprising, I mean, surprising, I think, to most people, uh, collapse of, of, of Credit Suisse and sort of forced merger of, of, of Credit Suisse. Um, and, and I think that um, the cracks are, are beginning to show a little bit like where we were back in 2006, 2007, 2008. Um, and uh, that, that was a function of higher rates, higher rates tightening. And obviously where the, the damage started was in the housing market. This time around, it's been in the banks. And, and it's been in the banks, interestingly, not because bad debts are going up, but because depositors are actually starting to move their money um, depositors have been, you know, they haven't j had a return for whatever it is, 13 years, 12, 13 years. All of a sudden, they can get a return um, from buying a, a gilt or buying a U.S. Treasury at four or five percent. So it's a huge, huge change. Uh, and I was looking at the, the Fed funds, funds rate before I came out, and and actually, six months ago in September, we were still only at 2.5 percent. So. In a way, it's surprising that the cracks are already showing when we've only been, you know, I know it's 5%, the Fed funds rate is 5% now and the Bank of England base rate is 4%, but only six months ago we were down in the, in, the, in the twos. So my expectation is there will be quite a lot. Monetary policy, generally speaking, works with a lag. Uh, and so we're really not going to see the effects of the rates that we see today, the 4 to 5%, probably until the autumn or maybe even early next year. So you're right, the cracks are, are showing, and I, I would expect those cracks. They're not going to come consistently. Um, they never do. That's the problem. They're very unpredictable. Um, but I suspect um, we will see more as these, these deposit, this deposit flight issue um, continues, which is something that really we haven't seen before, certainly not for a very long time. Um, in terms of, to answer your question about how we invest, the answer is cautiously. I mean, the good news is we are, we are now paid interest. We are now, I mean, we've got about 30% of our portfolio that's liquid at the moment in liquidity, um, but it's in US treasuries and, and UK gilts, uh, yielding that fall between four and 5%. So, so we are now being paid to be cautious, which amazingly, we haven't really been paid to be cautious for, for a long, long time. Um, so I think we have a portfolio which is, which is very defensively positioned. We've got a lot of liquidity. We've got index linked. We've got gold. Our e equities are probably the most defensive that, that they've ever been and with the lowest allocation of, of, of um, equities. I think one of the areas which certainly or a number of areas we would avoid, obviously, we, we don't hold banks. So that's, that's, that, that's, a, that's a good start. And, I must admit, I've saved an awful lot of sleepless nights by not owning banks in the last 20 years. But not just banks, but I, I think you want to be very, very careful about cyclicality because I think we are heading towards some, some sort of harder landing because if interest rates go from 0 to 5 very, very quickly, then almost certainly uh, we're going to see some sort of slowdown. And banks will uh, banks are clearly uh, holding back on, on lending due to that lower liquidity. So, so cyclicality you want to be very wary of and leverage. 
you want to be very wary of. And I think one of the things that's happened over the last decade or so is that companies, and this is actually right across the spectrum of all companies, have taken on incremental amounts of debt. So we've gone from a situation where probably uh, five, ten years ago, a company that was comfortable having one times net debt to EBITDA, i.e. one times their annual profits in debt, probably now has double that amount. They probably have two times. And the ratings agencies say, well, that's fine because interest cover is still very healthy, even with rates having gone up. But the more aggressive companies, uh, and certainly in the private equity space, where numbers are more like four, five, six times, and I've seen a number of US companies that have had debt because of deals that have been done at, at four times plus, they're suddenly saying, oh my goodness, our interest charge really is going up a lot. Our tax is going up a lot. Suddenly, even if their top line's growing and their profits are growing, their earnings are not growing because their tax rate's going up and their interest charges are going up. So, so I think that's, that's, I think, one of the dangers in particular that I think has been underrepresented within the market or always is sort of still a little bit misunderstood because I don't think, I think that's the lag effect. You haven't really seen that pain. And I think that companies are just hoping that that's going to go away, hoping that those interest rates are going to come back down again. Um, and uh, well, we'll see, but I suspect interest rates are going to stay higher for longer. So in which case then that, that is where particularly there could be some, um, some more accidents still to come. Sebastian, thank you for coming to the studio. Good to see you. And that's all we've got time for today. You can check out more Insider interviews on our YouTube channel where you can like, comment and subscribe. See you next time. Mm -hmm.